Hi all, um, my name is Taylor Naughton and I am the president and founder of CFC. Uh, thank you all for tuning in today for our sustainability panel. We believe this is a crucial conversation and we're so excited to have all of these people, um, these awesome individuals here to have the conversation and lead it. Before we get started though, I invite you to visit our website um, in which we have dedicated a blog for this event. It should give you a bit of a background to the conversation today, as well as link you to a survey that um, we've created. Please go ahead and take the survey. It will help out with the CFC team and better tailoring your, um, your experiences and our initiatives to you. Uh, the link should be below. Check the link below. Um, in addition, feel free to comment or ask questions in our chat. We will be here uh, waiting for those, and there will be a time for these to be answered later on in the conversation. That being said, it's time to pass off this off to our moderator to get this combo started. Rachel Missick, everybody. Thank you, Taylor. Um, so my name is Rachel Missick, and I'm a writer and strategist working at the intersections of fashion, feminism, and social impact. I work as both a writer largely telling women's stories and as a strategist in the emerging luxury fashion sector. I'm honored to be moderating such an important conversation on this year's Earth Day and excited to be joined by such esteemed guests in the fashion industry. The topic today is the future of fashion sustainability. With 10 years left to avert catastrophic climate change, the fashion industry is tasked with assessing and redesigning the decades old systems that have contributed to it being the world's second largest polluter. As, a fashion, as fashion water's consumption is set to double, by 2030 and the amount of waste it creates to increase to 148 million tons, the industry is needing to look forward in order to address how transparency, materials, workers' rights, and consumption will contribute to the overall sustainability of the industry and the environment. Having this conversation with me today are Hoda Katvi. Hoda is a, a Chicago-based Iranian-American writer, abolitionist organizer, and creative educator. She is also the founder of Blue Tin Production, a workers co-op run by working class women of color in Chicago. Also, we have William McNichol. William is the founder and lead designer of the Cleveland-based fashion brand, William Frederick. Much of his work is centered on rebuilding the garment manufacturing industry in Cleveland, Ohio. And then last but not least, we have Rachel Habegger. Rachel is a global and local supply planner for corporate retailers, as well as a sustainability consultant for emerging luxury brands. So, we can just jump right into the questions. Sustainability has taken on many meanings in the last few years and in different regions and markets, it has a more specific focus. So why don't we start by each of you going around and telling me what, how you define sustainability? Who wants to start? <laughs> I can go ahead. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, Rachel, are you gonna go? Oh, take the floor. Go ahead. <laughs> um, first of all, hello, and thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and also to learn from William and Rachel as well. Um, I think to I think where sustainability can give like a dissertation of an answer itself, but to keep it short as an intro, um, I think sustainability is not about like one or two things or about checking boxes, and it is an approach, and it is a mindset and a goal. Um, I think right now it's such a buzzword that I think intentionally doesn't actually mean anything particularly that's like globally recognized so that brands can just use it and mean that like, oh yeah, we like used one drop less water and therefore we're more sustainable this year. So I think the word is really bullshit and like, doesn't, I can curse, right? Is okay. Okay. Um, I think this is a very bullshit term <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Um, so I think it is, it's up to us to think about what is the world that we actually think um, is sustainable? And what are those specific metrics um, and goals and organizing strategy and um, systems that we want in place rather than like looking at um, end results without looking at processes or looking at processes without looking at end results. So it was a very vague answer for a very vague term, um, but I'm sure we're gonna dive into it more soon too. Yeah, Rachel, go ahead. Rachel, you can go next. Yeah, thanks. I would just echo everything you said. Um, and just I think of sustainability as systems thinking, 
Um, what within a system will make, make that system more resilient, have longevity and not degrade society or environment around it. And that includes many things. Like you said, it could be a dissertation by itself. So I, I do think that, um, sustainability as a term has been greenwashed, but there is, um, a lot of complexities and truth to it. And I would agree, it's something that has just been thrown around as a buzzword and become very overused by many in the industry. And I would say really what the focus should be is longevity in general and how to sustain longevity and then all of the processes that are involved in that and how we can attack those to make everything better across the board. Yeah, so I mean, sustainability obviously scales from the macro down into the micro, but um, Rachel, you work as a supply planner and sustainability consultant for emerging luxury brands. So you deal with the opaqueness of the supply chain regularly. Can you explain how this opaqueness or lack of transparency in a corporate structure perpetuates the status quo of production and profit? Sure. So I think that um, in the corporate world, especially corporate retail, um, specifically fast fashion, has little to none transparency in their supply chain. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the disconnection that that corporate home office has with its vendors, suppliers, producers. There's no emotional connection. Um, there is actually no physical, tangible connection. Um, and the corporate world, you are just clicking boxes, telling people uh, what to do. So it's really hard to have a connection an actual physical, emotional, um, and meaningful connection with that supply chain. And I think that is why there's very little transparency. People just have not had the curiosity to um, bring about that transparency. And I mean, in, in the corporate world that I've been in, uh, I believe that some corporations do try to have a little bit more transparency, but when you're within that supply chain, there are levers that are being pulled um, from third parties or just the actors within that supply chain to kind of um, bring that opaqueness back. So there are, um, I'm trying to explain, for example, many people, many corporations like Levi's um, will go into their, um, do regular audits in their factories, right? Well, those factories may come in beforehand and try to hide the things that they're doing um, and just little things like that that make the supply chain really difficult to see. And just the, the lack of meaningful connection between the supply chain and those who are running it. Yeah, so then um, where would you say transparency is necessary specifically in order to create um, broader impact? I think every step along the way there needs to be transparency. And um, I think up until this point, people have thought um, transparency giving away their competitive edge. But I believe that without transparency and without the um, sharing of ideas, resources, systems, we're never going to get to that resilient system and that sustainable system that we know can last for a really long time. So I think there just needs to be a real um, kind of backing away from this competitive nature and this um, exclusivity of information and really share resources and make a community so we can have that kind of transparency. Yeah, yeah. And I think that this applies from everything from materials to um, wages to environments. Um, Absolutely. You know, this is all still like very opaque. I mean, even when you look at um, Business of Fashion released the sustainability index and they ranked um, some top in, some top companies um, within the apparel industry in terms of their transparency. And it was alarming to see how opaque all of these companies are. Yeah, um, they, I mean, yeah. It's, it's supply chains in it of themselves are uh, extremely complicated. Um, no one's arguing that. Uh, but I don't believe that many of these companies even know all of the links in their supply chain. Yeah. 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 And I do think that the lack of transparency 
um, allows for these sorts of like violent um, uh, systems to exist. So, you know, like a um, like hoarding of wealth at the top, it, it, al- it, it, it perpetuates that issue or it perpetuates overproduction and it perpetuates Absolutely. like this, like, I mean, this like, I mean, I mean like maximum waste because mm-hmm. there is no clarity around these processes. Yeah, and I think it's um kind of a system of the these corporations saying, we're really trying to get this transparency, but there's just really not the approach that we need to see from these corporations. Yeah, I mean, Hoda, you obviously are running a production company right now. So, um, you know, you're you're on the ground, you're in, <laughs> you're running a manufacturer. So maybe you could, you could add to this as well around um, how organizations can become more transparent in their processes and the importance of doing so for the future of sustainability. Yeah, um, I actually want to like, I think flip what was just said a little bit. Um, I, I think it, maybe I think it's necessarily not that a lack of transparency leads to the ability to accumulate wealth, um, but vice versa. I think the goal is profit. Um, I think we live obviously, you know, in a capitalist society that values um, and supports and creates incentives for people to um, have a race to the bottom, as it's called, which means finding cheaper labor, cheaper resources. And that's going to be a perpetual race um, in order to create more and more profit. That's sort of this violent cycle, what we call capitalism. (laughs) And so um, at the end of the day, it's this sort of main focus on mass accumulation that then allows companies to want to specifically set up um, very long supply chains um, that are not transparent at all so that they don't have to, they can be at arm's distance and they don't have to be responsible. So I think transparency is an intended result of um, sort of wealth accumulation and capitalism and these like larger goals rather than like the reason for it, I think. Um, and and so that's why I think it's it's not always, like, I think transparency is very important, but I don't think it will ever come or is what the demand should be when it's always gonna be a byproduct of the deeper issue. And I think at the end of the day, we really have to think about the structures. Um, and I think Rachel mentioned this too, is like, this is this is really is about structures and processes um, and, and, and less about sort of like the smaller results that come out of that, that I think are catchwords that I think um, transparency is that right now and I think we're demanding transparency which is good and I think that's a good consumer demand to have but um, I think brands are really good at sort of adopting language in a way that satisfies rather than actually thinking about um, and changing systemic like ways that they're operating so to give an example from like a production point of view um, garment workers are at the bottom of the supply chain like absolute bottom and there's a reason why the majority of them are women of color and Muslim women of color from the global south. Um, and, and that's because when we look at where these production facilities are, they're in places that the United States, the United Kingdom and other European countries were colonized, all of these countries. There's still economic imperial influence um, in countries like Indonesia, in countries like Cambodia um, and other places around the world that it's not, it's not just like a, a sudden overnight thing that like American companies were like, oh, we can set up factories and pay people little. It's, we have to sort of contextualize fast fashion um, and the fashion industry at large, because it's also not just fast fashion that's using sweatshop labor, Fa- fashion at large and being able to become reliant upon cheap labor that their countries created for them. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And so I think being able to draw these larger connections between um, supply chains that are global and relying in and rooted in colonization, um, racism, anti-blackness, also policing and prisons, militarism, all of these are actually very deeply connected because they form this system that creates the conditions in which such shops are possible and enforces those conditions. Um, so for us as like a manufacturer, we recognize that there's no point of playing in a game that's inherently violent. Um, so we understand fast fashion to be inherently violent and fashion right now is violent, but it doesn't have to be um, because fast fashion is actually sort of like a newer phenomenon. It didn't always exist, right? Like we didn't always have like so much clothes around us and like $5 shirts available. So it is sort of like this, um, this new thing that's sort of being shoved down our throats. And the only way to meet fast fashion's production cycles, which are a new cycle every week, 52 um, seasons in a year, 
is through pushing people to do work that is humanly impossible, meeting quotas that are humanly impossible. And so to make people get closer to that, you have to insert violence and particularly gender-based violence. And this is very common practice and is required for fast fashion production or else you're not gonna meet these quotas and therefore it's not fast fashion. So for us, we recognize that there's no, you can't reform the system. You can't reform a system that is inherently violent whether it's fast fashion, whether it's sweatshops, whether it's policing, whether it's prisons, um, there's no reform, right? We have to call for abolition. Um, and abolition is just as much the destruction of these systems and removing the ability for these systems to continue harm and violence as it is imagining an alternative. So I think that's a lot of the work that we're trying to do is what does it mean for garment workers on their own terms, um, based on their own needs and their own vision, create clothes? Um, how can we create a place that you can go earn like a thriving wage, right? Because government workers also deserve to live full, happy lives and not just survive to get through the next day. Um, like a full life that also is where you can go to like heal through trauma, that you can like build community, that you can get political education, that mental, it, everything is sort of like there. So for us, it's, it's really trying to like think about not just what's wrong with the system, but what do we want? Um, and I think we need to be doing a lot more of that within the fashion industry at large. Yeah, absolutely. So similarly to um, Blue Tin Production, um, though it is not a co-op, it is a um, woman-run manufacturer in Cleveland, Ohio, and that is where William actually manufactures. It's called Forma Manufacturing. Um, and again, William is like very committed to revitalizing this garment industry in Cleveland um, by, and, and, and is um, like a foundation of his brand is this sort of localization as a form of sustainability. So William, why don't you tell us from a material standpoint, what role designers play in creating a more sustainable industry and how you're using your resource, your local resources um, to do your part? Okay, sure. And I'll speak mostly in general terms first and anything you want me to expand on and go deeper just for the sake of time. I'm happy to do that. I think on one side you have the design element in the textile. So generally we use either hemp, wool or secondhand fabrics which, and then also we do very small batch production. And I think something that's become popularized in the fashion industry are brands and companies and conglomerates that mass produce also claiming sustainability. And I think it's very important that we point out that it's literally impossible to mass produce and be sustainable. And so I, and I think a lot of brands you know, such as in Everlane, for example, they, they kind of preach sustainability, but then they mass produce and those two don't go hand in hand. So I just want to point that out to anyone who's, I know a lot of people I hear time to time, oh, I'm wearing Everlane, what they do is so great. And I would just think, hope that consumers would do a little bit more research there and dig deeper. So small batch production truly is the only sustainable method. And from a textile perspective, for example, let's highlight hemp. So growing hemp generally requires about 50% of the water usage that cotton does. So that's, and I know water usage is one of the fundamental points of sustainability and something everyone is trying to figure out and reduce the usage of. And in addition to that, it also is moisture wicking, anti-odor once it's an actual textile, which requires it to be washed less, which again is less water usage in that regard. And also just based on its density and the quality of the fabric, it is likely to last, last about two to three times long as cotton products do. So it's about really understanding your textiles and once they're made, how do they function in the actual world? How long will they last? And making sure that you're using those textiles specifically and not just going for the polys, the nylons, the synthetics and things that can't be composted or used to have a second life after the garment starts to break down. And for example, if hemp is undyed or untouched, once that fabric or piece starts to break down over time, it can actually be composted, which is a unique feature of hemp as well. I think there's also the manufacturing side in terms of localization. Everything I do is produced within a 20 mile radius of where I live and I'm able to pop in at any time and have a relationship with the garment workers. And on, I'm personally on a first name basis with the owner, the production manager and all garment workers at the factory, which I think is very critical as well. 
before I've produced anywhere, I've actually asked what the wages of the manufacturing workers are. And I've asked for that transparency, which the factory here in Cleveland has provided me with any information that I've requested. So we're, we're operating at full transparency on both sides in that regard. And in addition to that, I think when you talk about localization, now obviously that becomes very difficult when you start talking about growing textiles and fabrics in certain regions of the United States, because hemp, for example, is going to be grown much better in a tropical climate or a different climate than say Ohio or Kentucky or Michigan, Illinois. But when you, the one thing I think we don't talk about enough in terms of the manufacturing and the impact it can have on communities is Let's say, for example, during political seasons, and you come anytime you see someone in Ohio or Michigan, it's usually focused on manufacturing jobs or the auto industry. But then, if you look at consumer spending in the auto industry versus the retail industry and the apparel industry in the United States, they almost, I mean, they're battling each other. They're very similar, but we never talk about garment manufacturing when it can have a very similar impact on our local communities, specifically in the Midwest. So I think it's just about all, like all the way down to politicians and local people in the community and making them educated on the potential impact of these as well, not just from a let's reduce water, let's save the earth, but also how can we help our own communities grow in multiple ways. And I think that's an important part of sustainability is the localization of the entire process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really like this topic of regionalism and really looking to your own region for its resources. Um, and, you know, like you said, you won't have access to every sort of textile or fabric um, based on the agriculture in that region, but making sure you prioritize um, the textiles that you can obtain in that region, I think is, a, I think will be a huge step forward um, and really like insulating our local communities um, with the resources to to produce here. Um, but also, I mean, as a designer, you're obviously the designer on, on the panel. And something I'm really interested in is um, like the creative lens at which people look at sustainability. Um, you know, I think in recent years it's been greenwashed and it has certainly taken on a specific aesthetic. Um, and that's quite unfortunate because it should be integrated into all of our processes. But I think that it's really interesting the way that you specifically design for your brand so that it's, it's trendless and it's seasonless. So that means it has longevity. It means that that garment is going to last. It's not for, like Hoda was saying, it's you're not producing on a 52 season calendar. You're not producing based on a trend. You know, you're not, it's, it's not supposed to be ephemeral. It's supposed to last. It's supposed to be passed down. So I think from a design standpoint, that is both crucial to, you know, to production, but also to consumerism and kind of shifting these, these trends of consumerism and retraining people not to consume based on every little trend that hits Zara or H&M, but instead to invest in a piece that can actually last you your lifetime. Yeah, I think that's critical. And that's obviously to achieve a piece that can last decades and be passed down through generations, you have to have obviously the textiles and the quality which when the higher quality, I mean, everything, when you're talking about hemp, that's one of the most expensive products you can use. So, I mean, that, uh, that alone is going to come with a cost. But then in addition to that, you obviously need the manufacturing quality and the construction that will hold up over time and it will hold up over 10, 20, 30 years, which is the goal of everything I do. And I think in order to do that, you have to have fair wages for workers in the manufacturing industry. So there's talent retention. And I think, we, I mean, obviously we're located very close to Kent State University, which is one of the top fashion schools in the country, but most of those students feel a pressure to relocate to New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and other large cities where they may have opportunities. So I, I think kind of circling back to localization, if we had those opportunities, here in place and we were able to retain our own talent and truly foster a community, I think that could pay great dividends. But I think also educating consumers on like specifically my price points and why they are what they are is, for example, when I make a t-shirt, a garment worker is getting paid $19.50 per t-shirt that they make, which is completely outside of the industry norm. 
And that's going to result in a t-shirt that costs 65 to $70 when it's made with hemp. And that's, and, I, and that's only, I mean, that's less than the two times markup where most teas are anywhere from six to 12 times the cost of production. So it's educating people, you know, in Cleveland, this $60 t-shirt is going to raise most eyebrows. But when you start breaking it down in terms of the fair wages and everything that goes into my price point and the fact that a lot of my pieces are only one in each size per season, it starts to make sense over time. It's, it's obviously very difficult, but you just have to keep chipping away, educating and not stray from your process. Yeah, yeah. And I think all of this also ties really, um, like really innately into um, this issue with materials waste and pollution. Overproduction is going to result in waste, obviously. And this waste oftentimes finds itself to landfills in the global south, where it not only contributes to, um, you know, like faltering economies when they're left to deal with the resale of this waste, um, but also environmental pollution, um, you know, pollution in their local waterways, um, air supplies, all of this. So, you know, I think all of you can kind of chime in on, um, you know, just thinking of creative solutions for this sort of materials waste and, and pollution um, from both like a production aspect, a consumer aspect and a design aspect. I'll go last for this one, not the other two speak. I went first last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, okay. Um, so large scale production, right? And in, in the, the current climate we have with capitalism, as you said, Hoda, we are focused on short term gain. And we are on quarterly um, timelines, right? So some, some corporations are talking about going to uh, half year timelines. <laughs> Just, sorry, <laughs> just so they don't have to meet those short-term goals. But, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> she wants to talk. <laughs> but, so, to kind of go against this capitalist system, we need to think about having things more long-term, right? And it won't create that excess. But we also need to think about bringing the level of all systems up to a point where they are accountable for this excess, they are accountable for their supply chain, and anything that would happen after, the, after they've sold this product, so the lifetime of this product, right? And you're right, this, everything that is sent to the Global South has decimated their own economy there for our garment industry. And I think, um, that that impact also needs to be associated with this. Um, and I attribute a lot of these changes being made to accountability. I believe in shareholder liability and accountability. Um, without that, the people making these decisions to have this excess production and this mass accumulation of waste um, won't be changed under, until there's kind of accountability towards that. Yeah. Don't worry, Rachel, I was having kitten problems earlier. So. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> um, and that's also why I feel like very sporadic is because they're just running all over the place. So I apologize for looking kind of wild. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of steps, both like immediately and tangibly and then long term. I think at the end of the day, there is definitely a level of accountability. But I think that um, I think a lot of these changes need to be coming from garment workers and they are um, and coming from people on the ground whose lives are directly and first impacted. Um, I, I think there are massive garment worker movements, I think. I'm seeing massive garment worker movements around the world right now. And there are avenues for brands to be held accountable, but they're refusing. Part of that is because their sales aren't affected because no one here gives a damn, honestly. Um, and also there are really intense mechanisms in place locally uh, that uh, sort of support the, the silencing of garment workers. Um, and I think this again goes back to what are the deeper systems and structures and how are these all connected? So I think as like a, a few tangible things that brands should be able to do large scale and small scale is just like William mentioned is making direct relationships with manufacturers um, and being able to have actual um, 
uh, with, within like the, the brand structure, actual relationships that are not um, contractually based. They're not like just based on a specific production because that's not sustainable for the manufacturers. That allows brands to sort of come and go and they please look for cheaper production. I think there needs to be stronger, more intentional long-term relationships that are collaborative built with manufacturing and designers so that there isn't like a hierarchical relationship in supply chain, but that there are two parties that have equal weight and equal contribution to the creation of a collection that are working together as partners in order to create this. So I think that there, there needs to be stronger, more intentional, stable and long-term relationships across the supply chain at large. And that allows, um, that like directly leads to a level of accountability that everyone has agency within. So it's not just brands that can kind of dip their fingers and then when people start unionizing or garment workers start unionizing and things get a little bit more expensive, they can like jump out the factory collapses, starts again somewhere else with cheaper labor, and then they go back there. And that's a major crisis right now within the fashion industry, both fast fashion, um, brands like Nike right now at large, Adidas, Gap, all of these companies are doing this specifically in Indonesia, um, but also like luxury brands do this as well too. And so having more um, intentionally crafted partnerships and collaborations across supply chains, I think is one really, really important way. Um, and at the end of the day, long-term, uh, I think, there needs to be a level of ownership over the brands by garment workers. There needs to be more accountability, um, like, sorry, there needs to be more ownership and, um, and stakes that garment workers have within the brand that there is a level of profit sharing. And I think that's why a cooperative model for me is so important is that um, the way that right now people earn money is that around the world, not just in the fashion industry, you will always earn less than what you're contributing to a company, always. Whatever you're contributing, you don't actually get paid that value because that's where profit comes in. This is essential to capitalism is that you're always contributing a lot more than what you're actually getting paid. But instead, somebody else gets those profits. It's more heightened at the bottom of the supply chain, but it's happening everywhere. All of us are subject to that. And so being able to have garment workers actually receive profits um, and shared profits from companies that they're creating the clothes for, that's a long-term um, strategy in order for people to actually have more equitable um, wages and, and salaries across the supply chain. Um, is that these should be their companies too. Like there, there's no reason why the owner of Adidas or Nike or Intidex should be the richest man on earth while the garment workers creating these clothes can barely eat food. Um, so there needs to be a huge, huge structural change in the way that um, resources are allocated and taken also. So also another like major long-term um, but substantial and necessary for actual systemic change is like, massive decolonization. Um, right now, the United States may not have like, I mean, they have technically colonies in Hawaii, the whole United States, etc. cetera. Um, but there needs to be a demilitarization of the United States and other countries that are actively being used to enforce um, a militarism and enforcing uh, sweatshop conditions within countries. And I think there's a huge like arms deal. There's a lot of many like garment workers working in sweatshops that pre create US military uniforms. Like this is not like an abstract link. Um, I think this is very, very much tied together. Um, and then finally, ultimately we need to get rid of all prisons. And that's a substantial demand that is really necessary to end sweatshops in the fashion industry because so much clothes are being made in prisons right here in the United States. And so, so long as there are prisons, there will always be sweatshops and there's always gonna be garment worker exploitation. Um, so abolishing prisons is just as much a demand for black lives as it is a demand that the fashion industry should be having as well too. Just a few steps. <laughs> Rachel, was there any part of your question? Cause I know they just covered a lot. Is there anything you wanted me to speak to specifically from a designer or a brand standpoint to expand? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, from a system standpoint and from, um, you know, a worker standpoint, this topic of materials and pollution um, is, is incredibly macro, but then even down to a micro level of how a designer approaches it, you know, how you seek out textiles, what you do with excess, um, how you design for a lack of waste, and then like how these ideas have been instituted across the industry. And like, also, um, like how you're generating um, consumer interest in these sorts of ideas. So 
So in terms of waste and what we do with it, the first thing I do is when I purchase my fabric, I order a specific amount, knowing exactly what I'm heading into production with and the yield that each piece will take for fabrication based on whether it's a 46 inch roll or a 60 inch roll. So if I know I'm making five pieces of something that takes, let's say three yards, then I'm gonna probably order 16 yards or so and have a, like an extra yard just in case something goes wrong or there is something inconsistent in the fabric. And that way, so I'm proactive when I order the fabric, I know exactly what I'm producing. I know exactly how much yardage I need and I do all the calculations up front. A lot of the fabrics that I use, I can only purchase what's available because I'm using a lot of secondhand fabrics. So a lot of fabrics in my production runs are eight to 16 yards and that's not because I chose it. That's just simply because that's all that's available. So that's one way to really minimize waste is using dead stock fabric or secondhand fabric that doesn't require new production or new water or new dyes. And then in addition to that, I've actually, this collection, I've started dyeing my own pieces on a very small scale, like one at a time, but I'm dyeing with like leftover coffee grounds and coffee and tea and just things from my own kitchen that would otherwise potentially go to waste. So I think it's about just being kind of crafty and creative with utilizing all the resources that are available to you that you already have and doing everything you can to minimize using any new resources unless you absolutely have to. And, and that's why we've essentially made the switch to either a temp wool or secondhand product. And that's like essentially our textile exclusivity in that regard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the industry is starting to, um, to wake up to dead stock fabrics, um, to secondhand fabrics, um, to also recycled fabrics. Um, not to say that that is the solution for, you know, overhaul of an industry, but, um, you know, I do think that it is a step in the right direction. So Hoda, you obviously just touched on this, but I would love if you could expand on this connection between fast fashion and gender-based violence and also the fashion industry as modern day slavery. I think that topic right now is, it's so paramount that, that consumers start to understand this direct link between violence and the fashion industry. And then also the um, absolute need on a global scale for um, workers' compensation in order to actually change an industry. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Once I remove my kid behind my back. Um, okay, you can stay there. Um, yeah, so, so uh, a little bit about what we talked a little about earlier in, in terms of the ways in which strategically and intentionally garment workers are particularly women of color um, and Muslim women of color and um, something else that's also intentional in the fashion supply chain within production factories is that men are usually opted as managers. And the reason for this is that whenever we're thinking about meeting these massive demands, these massive, um, these very timely uh, production deadlines, um, as I mentioned, the only way that you can get there is through violence. You can only make people work faster than humanly possible when there are threats of sexual assault, there are threats of rape, there's actual gender-based violence happening on production floors. And so there's a very intentionality to the gender dynamics that are set up in production factories across the world, here in the United States, as well as abroad, so that um, gender-based violence can be used as a means to enforce timelines and quotas. Um, this is unfortunately not like in one or two factories. This is systemic and, and structure-wide, structure-wide globally <laughs> within um, production factories. And we've seen so much data, so many reports. The Global Labor Justice Organization puts out reports on this frequently. Um, there's interviews, so much firsthand testimony that you can see um, and crises that are happening just constantly and, and, and all around the world. So this sort of setup is really, really intentional and a product of uh, fast fashion needs for these speeds and quotas and demands. Um, and a lot of that, and I, and I think the term modern day slavery, I have some critiques about. I think that um, I don't wanna like, and I know that that's not what is being assumed, but that, um, that there, there is sort of like an equivalent to slavery um, within sweatshops. Obviously the conditions are horrible and awful. Um, and there's very little agency that you have over your life or that like slavery ended in the United States given that 
prisons and policing really continue a lot of that legacies today and their vestiges of slavery, which now are involved in such shop production. So um, there really is sort of no way out for a lot of garment workers, unfortunately, given that, again, um, in, in places that sweatshops exist, uh, they're being exploited for specific economic or gender-based reasons. So in the United States, for example, a lot of garment workers are particularly undocumented. And um, people hiring for fashion factories are also specifically looking for undocumented workers. Because a common practice here in the United States is that um, you, you hire a bunch of undocumented workers after they start getting angry and upset that you haven't paid them in four months, you come and call ICE and you have an ICE raid of your own factory in the United States. And so everybody is just packed up, deported, and then you start fresh and you've never had to pay anybody. We have a factory here in the Chicago um, area that does that frequently there. Um, I personally know garment workers who are swept up in raids in Los Angeles, in New York, this is a very, very common practice. And so we see it's not just the intersections of like one or two things. These are very like layered. It's the sort of the epicenter of systemic violence according to race, status, gender, um, identity, economic class, all of these things that sweatshops really just benefit from all of it, um, which I think is, is both depressing and, and horrifying and awful, but also can be seen in a positive way because that means that whenever we're sort of fighting against any of these larger issues at hand in a systemic way, in a truly systemic way, we're also supporting garment workers. So I think that there is also a beauty in the fact of, of, of this realization that everything is connected because that allows our movements to then also be really interconnected and de-siloed. Um, because we recognize that we can't fight for garment workers if policing or prisons exist or ICE exists, for example, because they rely on each other and they're all sort of tied up. So I, th I think that there are a lot of vestiges of slavery that are still sort of present within sweatshop enforcement and the existence of sweatshops. Um, and I, I think that there are a lot of, yeah, a, a lot of work to do um, in many different ways in order to address that. And I don't know if I got to the second half of your question. I was a little bit distracted. No, you did, you <laughs> covered it. I mean, you also addressed this idea of um, the fashion industry as modern day slavery, just with the production of so much of our, of our garments in prison systems, um, which I think a lot of people don't know that. No, unfortunately, yeah. As well as um, police military gear, which is ironic in the worst type of way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So over the last two decades, consumption of fashion has increased by 400%. Um, this largely has to, this goes hand in hand with the rise of fast fashion, um, also with the rise of social media and increased marketing. Um, so, you know, as brands push out, you know, marketing across so many platforms and the consumer is always stimulated, um, consumption obviously is on the rise. But with that has also come the growth of circularity um, with companies like The Real Real and Thread Up becoming very popular. So, in your opinion, is circularity um, is circularity the solution to our waste problem? Rachel, I feel like you have a look on your face, and you. Want to, you want <laughs> I'll to attack to this. this. <laughs> so, I think that um, thrifting and reselling that whole market it, ha it definitely has ballooned um, recently. Uh, I think it has good intentions. I think the intention is really good there. Um, and I think someone asked a question about thrifting also and whether or not it's just sustainable. I think as a system, no. But I think there are aspects that can be applied to help um, the advancement of sustainability. So using one um, product again and again through the life, through its life, innately will help reduce waste. But the fact that we know as consumers that we can just get rid of our clothes, send them to a Goodwill, maybe thrift them, get some money, and then go buy some more is the problem. And like we talked about before, that whole reselling and the thrifting, um, that industry, because it's ballooning, is also creating more waste itself. And that again is being sent to the global south. So I think um, 
the intentions are good there. There just needs to be some system changes. So we avoid the mistakes that have already been made in corporate and luxury brands. Yeah. I have some input on this too. So I think the thrifting and the secondhand market and kind of the expansion of that, especially in a luxury sense, when you're speaking real, real and things of that nature, I think that's also, I mean, it's kind of unavoidable based on our economy, but capitalism is also weighing on that. And I think it's a little complicated because there's also some white privilege attached to there in terms of access to things. And I know specifically locally, there are sometimes issues where people are going in and kind of just raiding these thrift stores with the intention of reselling for their own vintage pop-up or something like that. And then the people who actually need those clothes at price points no longer have access to it. And I think that's something that needs to be discussed more because it's not as simple as, oh, we're only using second hand or we're thrifting and this is the real solution. And the other issue with that is there's no garment manufacturing involved in it. So there's a potential reduction of job opportunities, especially locally. And if you're if you're only thrifting and you're not purchasing from local brands that are doing small batch production and paying their garment manufacturers fair wages, then those could be eliminated. Like you've seen in Cleveland. I mean, there's, I think there's less than 10 or 15 workers in the entire garment industry in our city. So to me, thrifting somewhat poses a threat to that. So I, I personally am torn. I think it's better than mass production and fast fashion, but I don't agree that it would be better a better solution than local production with fair wages attached. Yeah, absolutely. Hoda, do you have, um, I, I feel like you had something to say, something to add. No, I mean, I, I think William and Rachel uh, really hit the nail on the head. Is that the thing? They did the thing. Mm -hmm. They said the thing really, really well. Um, I think the only thing that I would just say that sort of echoes that a little bit is that I think there's a difference between an individual choice and a structural change. Um, I think at the end of the day, individual choice is important, obviously, to some degree, um, but not important in structural change as much. I think, sure, like thrift if you want, um, if that makes you feel better. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's a relationship to consumption that needs to be changed. It's the relationship with the understanding of who made the clothes, how you value clothes. Um, and the analogy or parallel that I always give is like thinking about your closet, like you would like an art gallery, you know, you don't like fill it with art pieces. You pick a few pieces that you invest in and you appreciate each like brush stroke and like think about that as you would each thread. Um, and because clothes are arts. And I think being able to value it as such and valuing the labor of women that went into it, whether or not that's something that you can afford, I think should be expensive. Like it's not expensive, but it, it should be like people should be paid well and it should be more than $5. Um, and I, I think that th there's definitely an accessibility issue there. So I don't think that it's like you're a bad person if you can't buy ethical. I think each of us should make our own individual choices about how we feel good to operate in the world but then also think about how we can together um, organize towards systemic change. So I think there's also sort of like a little bit of like a, like a line between like, what do you wanna do for yourself, for your own conscience? And then how can we actually collectively organize together? And what are those systemic issues uh, and solutions? And thrifting isn't a systemic solution for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think you just kind of touched on my last question, which was um, looking forward, what role do consumers play in the future of fashion sustainability? Um, and I think this comes down largely to consumption. <laughs> we can't consume our way into a sustainable future. So, and I also think that, um, you know, a part of this goes back to our first topic, which was transparency. And on a consumer side, demanding more transparency um, from, from these brands, from these companies. So Rachel or William, anything to add there? Well, I would just say, Consumers, yeah, definitely need to lead the charge here and expect more. Um, but I think that the systems behind um, the industry need to bring the minimum of amount of care 
up way high because not all consumers are going to care. Not all consumers are going to want this. So the industry kind of has to give, tell the consumer what they want, right? So I think at a system level, the changes needs to be made to affect the consumer. Yeah. Absolutely. So for our last few minutes, we're going to open up to some questions that Taylor has been taking from our guests on YouTube. So um, the first question is with today's top luxury fashion houses, um, not doing sustainable work. Um, I'm curious if any of you have an opinion on how they start moving in a sustainable direction. And this was asked by Camille. William, it's your turn to go first. This is complicated because it kind of circles back to my point that it's impossible to mass produce and be sustainable. And likely a lot of the companies that you're referencing, like under an umbrella of LVMH or something along those lines, I mean, you're looking, it, it's nearly impossible for them to become sustainable. I, I mean, they can obviously start adopting simple practices like what textiles are using, like using a tenfold that's 99% biodegradable or using a hemp that uses 50% less water as a crop. But then, I mean, I can't even imagine what the price points would be for a luxury brand that's using fabric too expensive as hemp. So, I mean, there's, it's very complicated in terms of how that can even be addressed. I mean, it almost circles back to Hoda's point about really abolition is the only answer for, I mean, it's fast fashion. To me, a lot of the luxury brands in fast fashion kind of present the same issues. I don't really see them as separate problems. I think they're both mass producing in their own ways. And as long as that continues, I mean, our earth and garment workers and everyone will continue to see the effects of it. But I, I, I just want to kind of add on here. I do think I would agree with you, but I do think that luxury fashion has the most potential to change. Mm -hmm. If you think about the origins, I mean, these fashion houses, it's not like they, they sent out 16 collections every year, you know? It was the regular, like, you know, holiday, you know, like three, four collections a year. And I think kind of backpedaling might lend to their exclusivity, um, but the profit is the problem, right? That, that profit is the problem. They will lose that, yeah. Yeah, so um, another question. Does thrifting have an impact on sustainability if we're still purchasing from brands like Zara and H&M secondhand? And this is by Sam. And in a general sense, it extends the life of the piece that was originally, I mean, there was problems obviously with the production of the czar or the H&M piece, but it's better that someone's still wearing it as opposed to just being tossed. I, that would, so yeah, secondhand czar or H&M is better than firsthand czar or H&M. Yeah. Um, so we have from Jennifer. What are your thoughts on the next steps to advance fashion sustainability given these insights? Um, I feel like we've had a thousand insights today and we have gone from the most macro down to the most micro, but if you guys could sum it up, what would you say in just a few sentences, each of you from your specific expertise? I, I think ultimately, um, I think we, we need just a collective shift from an I to a we. Um, I think a lot of the times, and this is you know a really Western concept, but I think we're always asking, what can I do? What can I do? What should I buy? If I buy this, you know, is it more sustainable or ethical? Um, but that's, as Rachel mentioned, um, you can't buy the revolution. You can't buy sustainability. This is not about consumption. Um, it's not about buying things or like your individual decision as it is about systems change. So I think as we're, as we're moving forward and trying to think about this future, um, I think we really have to be rooted in a few things. And that's one, what industry is inherently violent? Like what actually requires violence? And 
So therefore, what should we call for the end of rather than a reform? Um, and I think this applies to the fashion industry as much as it does other industries. I think it helps us realize what the demands should be if we know if this is an industry that's redeemable or if it requires violence. And if it's always going to require violence, then that's not something that we want reform. We just want the end of it. And so how can we get there? Um, and then secondly, I think that a lot of this work lacks visionary work. I think all, a lot of our movements need a lot more visionary work. Um, so I think asking your question really like, what does the world look like that you want to live in, both in terms of a fashion manufacturing point of view or fashion production or how you buy your clothes, um, but also at large, like what does it mean, like what does the ideal workplace look for you, look like for you? Like what do you really, like what does it mean to like create clothes and buy clothes and like, um, and, and enjoy fashion for its art um, rather than just like cheap costs. So I think, and then this like future vision, what does that mean that we should be doing today and tomorrow in order to get there? So I think it's really thinking about things systemically and within like a future driven perspective. All right, so. I kind of echo that um, as a systems change. I think that there needs to be a complete innovation um, on the industry systems and structure. But I also think there needs to be a mind shift away from um, such mass production and um, high profit. So as an industry, I think that mind shift needs to happen, but also a sharing of resources because once that innovation happens, we need to be able to communicate that to the, to the world effectively so that they can then enact those systems and changes and innovations. So I think that this competitive nature of the fashion industry really needs to take a step back um, and kind of work together to innovate. Yeah, and to a specific point for me, I would say, if you're focused on localization like I am and restoring a garment manufacturing industry in an entire city, uh, you would hope that the community around you and their actions would support their proposed values. And I think there's sometimes a lot of emptiness in some of the values that people are requesting and also proposing within these communities. And Want, wanting local production, wanting fair wages, but then also not wanting to purchase a product that actually is based on those values and the price points that come along with that. So I think it's, it, it all boils down to, I mean, it's obviously many layers to it, but when it, you're fighting consumer, consumerism and capitalism, it's, I don't know, it's very tough to cut through. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you guys, thank you so much for these insights today. Um, I feel like this was, again, we went from such like large scale ideas all the way down to Cleveland, Ohio, where, you know, Williams manufacturing. Um, so we're going to bring Taylor back in one more time before we leave. So Taylor, why don't you join us? Hey, everybody. Um, thank you once again so much. Um, this was Awesome, fascinating, learned so much. Um, for all of the viewers, uh, just a quick reminder, please visit our blog, please take our survey, um, even just check out the website and apply if you wanna be a part of Chicago Fashion Coalition. We have a rolling acceptance. Um, also, if I could get each of your individual um, Instagram handles, can you guys share that out so that everyone can follow you after uh, this, this conversation? Yeah. Koto, why don't you go ahead? Uh, just at my first and last name. <laughs> um, and then Blue Tin is at Blue Tin Production. Rachel? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't get off mute. Um, my handle is also my name, but it's a little L in the middle. So Rachel L. Habegger. Awesome, and William? It's williamfrederick.cleveland. And mine is at Rachel Missick. Thank you, um, and thanks again. Subscribe, click, go to the blog, and uh, this was awesome. Thanks guys, happy Earth Day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, happy Earth Day.